So another new drug, uh, saponamode. So uh, Wallace, why don't you take us uh, through saponamode? So saponamod is a recently approved uh, medicine from the same family as fingolimod, so uh, sphingosine one phosphatase um, modulator. Uh, I guess saponamod is exciting for a, a couple of reasons, but, but particularly because uh, this is a medicine that's been shown to have a positive phase three trial in uh, secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. So this was the expand study. Um, the in subgroup analyses, it looked like the, the, the benefits of saponamod on reducing the risk of confirmed disability worsening were mainly driven by patients who had our so-called active secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. So patients in, who had ongoing um, relapses or MRI evidence of disease activity. And that's the label that the medicine has um, received in Europe for that subgroup of patients with secondary progressive MS. Although I understand in the United States, you've got a, a much broader label, even though formal studies in patients with CIS or um, relapsing remitting MS have, haven't been undertaken. Right. Uh, did you want to say a little bit about how saponamu differs from fingolimu? So there are some, there are a number of uh, S1P uh, receptors in the body, and saponamod is more selective than fingolimod. And in, in, in theory, um, that, that may influence both efficacy, but also potentially side effect profile. So um, bradyarrhythmias and um, bradycardia, which are a concern with fingolimod, seem to be less common in, in, in saponamod. Uh, in patients treated with saponamod, partly because of a, a, a dose titration um, used to mit mitigate this first dose effect. All right, so saponamod is sort of selective for S1, P1, and P5. Uh, fingolimod hits 1, 3, 4, and 5, and um, may explain some of the differences there. But I think you bring up one important point is that with the, with the dose escalation, there is no first dose observation uh, with saponamod. Uh, Patricia? Uh, use of saponamod? What? Well, so um, saponamod is a second generation S1P receptor modulator. It's beginning to get a crowded field. I think it was very impressive that they had a phase three trial positive in pretty significant secondary progressive MS. You have to give credit. They met the primary outcome. It was critiqued as not being a stunning uh, success in the primary outcome. Nevertheless, it was. And this is a small molecule that penetrates into the CNS. And therefore, it's at least possible, and there are S1P receptors inside the CNS, that it could be having a direct effect on neurodegeneration to have an impact on secondary progressive MS. So it was terribly disappointing when that was not recognized by the FDA. However, I think if you look at the S1P receptor modulators as a class, you might make the argument that saponamod, if it's effective in relapsing, which is clearly true, you have a phase two trial and look at the other S1P receptors, plus it has a neurodegenerative effect. <clears throat> you could potentially say, is that my preferred <clears throat> go-to S1P receptor modulator? I think that's a very intriguing question to think about. Maybe, maybe I can add that I was impressed by the expand trial because of the patient recruitment. If we compare all the different trials in secondary progressive MS patients, I had the impression that the majority of trials really tried to also involve late stage relapsing remitting MS patients with a lot of inflammatory activity. And this is maybe also the reason why the um, um, better interferon trial in SPMS in Europe was positive while it was negative in the US. I think in the European trial, there have been 70% of patients with a relapse while being in the study. And if we compare this to the recruitment strategy of the EXPAND trial, where we had over 50% of patients already having an EDSS of 6 or 6.5, I think this is the first trial ever really recruiting a pure SPMS um, cohort. And, and this is why I support um, Patricia's uh, take on the study. I think we saw something in this really 
progressive cohort. And, and, and this is much more meaningful uh, as, as been reflected by the approval of Siponimod. And in Europe, I have to say, it's only approved for secondary progressive MS with activity. And this activity has to be shown by clinical relapses or by MRI activity. So far in Europe, we have two approved um, S1P modulators. However, we can not use them as a first line therapy because we have Fingolimod for active patients and Ziponimod for active SPMS patients. And, and, and this is for me hard to understand, I have to say. Awesome. I don't think I have any further comments that we ha we don't have access to saponamod yet in the UK, so I, I, I haven't used the, the drug myself. So, so you've highlighted some of the paradoxes with this drug. So I, I, I agree, this was a really good study. I think they set out to get a group of patients with secondary progressive MS and they succeeded. It's a population like no other study. Uh, that's been done. And so I give them a lot of credit for doing that. They had high EDSS, they had long duration of disease, um, and it was a good study. And as Patricia said, it was a modest effect, but it was an effect uh, that clearly occurred. And now the confusion is in the labeling, uh, both in the expanse of the labeling, which was a leap because of the way this drug was done. But for me, the more troubling is the, the lack of understanding of the regulators of what the term activity means. And, and, and so, and, and Wallace and I have had this discussion when I visited uh, out in their place, I guess a year and a half ago, and that is activity must be framed in time. And neither regulatory group on either side of the Atlantic recognized that this must be framed in time. What that does is if you say secondary progressive with activity, that is every secondary progressive patient. Because by definition, they had to have activity at some point. And then the regulators split on how they defined activity. So in the US where the regulators don't accord a lot of respect to MRI, they only talk about clinical activity. Uh, the European regulators talk both about clinical and MRI activity, but again, neither one specify the time frame. Um, one could have done that, but even then you were looking at a subset analysis of a clinical trial. Um, and as scientists, we're always cautious about what you do with subsets and how you interpret them. Um, and so this is a, an interesting situation. Uh, we have a, a, a paper in press right now in neurology trying to clarify these issues for the community so at least they will understand uh, what the concepts are around having activity and not having activity. And most importantly, this issue of, of time framing. <laughs>